I'm sure you've seen it before. Articles and posts talking about how billionaires paid next to nothing in taxes this year, and if they did, how they paid less than you. Like how Warren Buffett pays fewer taxes than his secretary. Seriously. Taxpayers can be broken up into those who accept them as a fact of life and complain, but pay, and those who resent, despise, and detest taxes and do everything in their power to pay the least amount possible. Chances are, if you're watching this video, then you fall more into the latter category. Well, you're in luck today, because we're going to be talking about some of the ways that the rich minimize their tax responsibilities, but also how they manage to protect their wealth. Let's go. So probably one of the best things a rich person can do to protect their money is die. Seriously. So the one specific thing that I'm talking about is the stepped up basis. So let's say Johnny Smith was a smart young lad and bought Berkshire Hathaway, Apple and Nike in his youth for very cheap. He kept on to these stocks and just recently died. Now these stocks are worth a lot of money, and if he sold them while he was alive, he would have to pay a lot of taxes. However, Johnny was smart, and his son Tommy Smith inherited the stocks upon Johnny's death. This is where the step-up basis kicks in. Now the value of the asset is readjusted to current market prices for tax purposes. This new value will be the starting price for any future capital gains taxes. So if Johnny bought all the stocks for $100,000 and the stocks were worth $1 million when Johnny died, upon inheritance, the basis of the stocks readjusts to $1 million. So if Tommy sold all of the stocks then and there, he pays no capital gains tax because the basis is equal to the sales price. If he waited and sold the stocks for $1,050,000, then he would pay capital gains tax on the $50,000. Now since we're on the topic of stocks, another thing rich people do is borrow against their stocks. Now remember, the name of the game is to pay as few taxes as possible. So let's say this rich guy wants to get some cash real quick, but he doesn't want to sell any assets and incur any capital gains tax. Instead, he takes a loan against his assets, using the assets as collateral. They work out the small details, interest rate, the value of the portfolio, repayment date, and so on, and also how much they can borrow, eh, usually 50 to 70% of the value of the asset. Bing, bang, boom, congratulations. Now you basically have free money. Loans are not considered income, so they cannot be taxed. Just be sure to pay your interest and you are golden. You can use these funds to buy real estate, for personal expenses, and other investing. Uh-oh, what happened if the value of the assets drop and now the lender does a margin call? Doesn't matter. This millionaire is smart and he has someone managing his stocks and doing readjustments here and there to make sure that this situation never happens. Another great thing at your disposal is gifting. Now the tax you're dealing with in this specific case is the estate tax. So what the rich people do is actually gift some of their estate to someone they know, usually their family. And in 2024, the max you can gift without any tax repercussions is 18,000. So let's say Tommy gifts his son 18,000, not a dollar more. Perfectly fine, no issues. But guess what? He has two more kids, 18, 18, 18, no issues. Guess what? Tommy's married. That means both people can gift 18,000 to each kid, meaning each kid gets $36,000, no taxes, no issues. And the best part is you can do this every year. Another thing to be aware of is the lifetime gift and estate tax exemption, which as of 2024 is 13.61 million per person. So you should try and stay at or below the 18,000 gift tax limit, but let's say you gift your kid something worth 318,000. Well, the first 18,000 are safe under the gift tax limit, but the remaining 300,000 is not. You then notify the IRS of the 300,000, which they track, and then they deduct the 300,000 from your lifetime gift tax exemption. So you go from 13.61 to 13.31, assuming you haven't gone over before. Also, usually the donor has to pay the tax and the rate ranges between 18 and 40% depending on the value. Now, Charles Schwab says that the 13.61 million exemption applies to the gift and estate taxes combined. Any portion of the exemption you use for gifting will reduce the amount you can use for the estate tax, end quote. So when you die, the IRS can tax your estate if it exceeds the federal tax exemption level, which we said for 2024 is 13.61 million. However, since you gave 300,000, your exemption is now 13.31 million, meaning should you pass on your estate onto someone, the government will tax your estate if it exceeds 13.31 million. With all that being said, it's in your best interest to stay under the 18,000 so you can pass on a larger estate. <sighs> that was a bit complex, but this one should be a little bit easier to understand. Now we're gonna be talking about offshore accounts, which are exactly as they sound, basically having a bank account in a foreign country with little to no taxes. 
Now, according to Investopedia, the level of regulatory standards and transparency differs widely among OFCs, but they generally offer favorable tax laws, which is why they're commonly referred to as tax havens, reduced risk and greater growth potential, significant cost savings for businesses, protections of assets, especially during times of instability, loose regulations, and confidentiality. However, depending on the country you're a citizen of, you may be required to disclose the OFCs you have and any income earned. And also policies change. Switzerland was the gold standard for OFCs. They had very strict privacy laws, but due to years of outside pressures from foreign governments, Switzerland relented and they gave all this account information to the foreign governments that they requested. Now this next topic covers two things, but they actually can work together. They're called trusts and foundations. A trust is a fiduciary arrangement that allows a third party or trustee to hold assets on behalf of a beneficiary or beneficiaries. Trusts can be arranged in many ways and can specify exactly how and when the assets pass to the beneficiaries. Now a trust can be revocable or irrevocable. A revocable trust means the grantor has control and can do whatever they want with the trust, even dissolve it. They can be continually modified after being set up and they're easier to set up compared to irrevocable trusts. An irrevocable trust means the grantor relinquishes control and the terms cannot be changed. They also offer estate tax benefits, which revocable trusts don't. Regardless, trusts can be used to provide income without having direct ownership of the asset. And since trusts usually avoid probate, your beneficiaries may gain access to these assets more quickly than they might have to assets that are transferred under a will. Additionally, if it is an irrevocable trust, it may not be considered part of the taxable estate, so fewer taxes may be due upon your death. Now, foundations can be set up as a trust or a corporation, also can be private or public. But for this specific example, we're gonna be doing a private foundation. So Johnny Smith created a foundation and then donated some of the assets to it. Now, donating to foundations is considered tax deductible. So Johnny lowers his tax liabilities. Now, the foundation can use these assets as they please. And since Johnny and his family are board members on the foundation, they can do whatever they want with the money. Quote, as there are no shareholders or owners, there is no requirements to have beneficiaries. Hawksford has experienced a growing trend to use a foundation as an ultimate holding vehicle, which separates underlying assets from an individual's personal wealth, therefore falls outside his or her estate for inheritance tax purposes, end quote. So as long as this foundation exists, your family can still make charitable donations and get the tax deductions. So a win-win. There are many other ways that rich people avoid paying taxes. Depending on the feedback, I'm happy to make a part two. So let me know in the comments down below. And until then, I'm Evan, and thanks for watching. If you like what you just saw, then click on the video here. Also, if you haven't, like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you don't miss any future videos.